today as we reflect on the gospel lesson that we had before us. Now, this comes from the Sermon on the Mount. And for the life of me, I don't know, some people go, oh, the Sermon on the Mount, I love the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount is convicting, it's full of law, it's got all this other stuff. Now, we enter into the Sermon on the Mount with the Beatitudes or the blessings that Jesus pours out on his disciples and on you and me as well. So being blessed is part of what he's teaching us today, but then he's also teaching us about our calling. Let me read to you the last two blessings that he shares. He says, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad. I don't know about you, but that doesn't sound like the kind of blessings I'm thinking about, right? When I think about Jesus pouring out a blessing, you know, it's that I've got good health and my family's doing well and we're truly blessed. Thank you, Lord. But Jesus says, blessed are you when people persecute you, when they utter all kinds of evil against you on my account? The answer is yes. It's a blessing to be, well, an image of Christ in the world. And that's going to happen sometime. So, we step from the blessings into our calling. And he calls us to be salt and light. Now I'm going to visit those later because I want to first get down to the very last verse that was read for you today. The very last verse, Jesus talks about uh, he didn't come to abolish the law, but he came to fulfill the law. And in that, that's a powerful statement. And then he ends it all by saying, For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now, we spend in 21st century preaching, and we spend a lot of time talking about how the religious leaders of the day had hard hearts towards Jesus. They wanted him dead. They wanted him gone. And yet, for the hearer of that day, when they heard Jesus say, your righteousness needs to exceed theirs, they would have thought, well, I can't ever do that. Why? Because these people were rule followers, man. You had the scribes who had the written law, but then you had the Pharisees who, who went beyond the written law and said, well, this is how it applies to our lives. You can do this, but you can't do that. And they were good at living lives, fulfilling the law, being righteous on their own, you might say. And so when they, uh, when they live life, for instance, if they grew a garden, they would tithe 10% of even mint that grew in their garden. It'd almost be embarrassing to ask how many people today tithe in their life, right? A tenth of everything going to the work of God's kingdom. So uh, they would do that. No problem. They tithed everything. They spent all day in Bible studies. They'd be in the Word of God, committing it to memory all day long in the Word. Anybody want to join me for an all-day Bible study? Yeah. And then, well, dietary restrictions as well. They had dietary purity, and they were really good about it. And I don't know how many of you have been on a diet. I know I have, and, and it's kind of like, well, I'm on this diet, but... Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and have a little of this and cheat a little bit, right? They were good. So what was Jesus saying to the disciples and to us when he says, your righteousness needs to exceed theirs to get to the kingdom of heaven? He's telling us that they're not good enough on their own to do it, and neither are we. They're not good enough. You know, a lot of people do good in this world. And there's a lot of good things happening all around them. You'll see people that um, are just compassionate towards others. And they reach out to others in need, and it's a beautiful thing to behold. But I'm going to let you in on a little secret. Not everybody that's compassionate is a Christian. There are compassionate people of other faith traditions. There are compassionate atheists. There are compassionate people all over the place. They're doing good things. And it's nice that they're compassionate. Some are attached to a, a, a noteworthy cause. Maybe it's an organization that they're trying to benefit, some cause out there. And there's a lot of good people in, investing in these noteworthy causes, but they're not always Christians. 
There's good stuff going on all the time. I read yesterday an article about a, a young man, a fifth grader in Bloomingdale, and the young man in Bloomingdale, he, uh, he's had brain cancer for most of his life. He's, it's recurred. It's, he's in his third recurrence. And interestingly enough, this article wasn't a, an article of pity for this poor young man that's having his third bout of brain cancer, but it was an article about what a joy he is to others. He takes it upon himself in the midst of his trials to make everybody else feel better. God gave him a heart that concer concerned himself with the welfare of others. So when he's in, I forget they're like on the 18th floor of some ward, when he's in there, he goes around with no shirt on so the other kids can see his scar from his port, and he's just a joy. The doctor that's been treating him calls him the mayor of the 18th floor, I think he called it, you know, just going around, making adults and children alike feel better while he struggles with cancer. That's some good stuff, isn't it? There's goodness that happens all over the place. The problem is, Martin Luther wrote this, and he quotes somebody else as well. The problem is, when we look to goodness to be our righteousness, well, we've got an inherent problem. Luther writes, the great danger is the doing of good works. It's what the pot papists call the practice of virtue. There is no scandal greater, more dangerous, more venomous than a good outward life manifested by good works in a pious mode of life. That is the grand portal, the highway that leads to damnation. Do what? The high, good works are a highway that leads to damnation? I thought we were called as Christians to do good works. We are, but we're going to get to that. What was he talking about then? If the Pharisees weren't good enough by living lives to get to eternal life with God, neither are we. And if we think that our good works are our path to heaven, we've failed. It's not about what we've done. It's about what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. That's the bottom line. We can never do enough good works to build a ladder to heaven. So, good works can lead to damnation if that's what you're leaning on to get you to heaven. And I love the fact that we're all gathered here in worship today. I do. I celebrate the fact that we've got people I see every week, we've got guests, we've got our baptism and, and the, our guests with us today as well there. I, I celebrate it. But why do we go to worship? Is worship for God or is worship for us? That's a question worth asking. Now I've told you before I read study notes from a guy named Phil Brandt uh, uh, almost every time I preach and I love the way he said it. He said, now he's reflecting on the reading from Isaiah, by the way. In the reading from Isaiah, God spoke for, through the prophet Isaiah to tell the people that their fasting is done in vain. They think that they're doing this uh, spiritual practice of fasting, and yet in the background, their hearts are full of evil and malice. And this is what he says. Isaiah says that the hypocrisy of their lives betrays their prayers. They come to church in shoes made by slave laborers in China, in clothes put together in a sweatshop in Vietnam. They seek their own pleasure in their fasting. Folks who use Lent to lose weight or who give their time teaching Sunday school just so someone will notice. Is this the person who is angling for a job by volunteering? Is this the person who goes to church because it gives them a good context to sell insurance in the community? Another possibility is that they sit behind the person with whom they disagreed at the last voters meeting and think their evil thoughts and never imagine that this ought to be rectified before they kneel at the altar. They hit with the wicked fist and curse with wicked to twisted tongues. We imagine that somehow the fact that we've come to church, that we've endured another sermon, you would never tell me that, right, okay? That we've endured another sermon or put an offering into a plate somehow. This means God is happier with us than he is with the fellow down the street who slept in and watched ESPN today instead of coming to worship. But is that so? Does God's economy of friendship and love really work that way? And do I really want it to? I'll tell you in short, no we don't. 
We don't want it to work that way. God loves us in spite of who we are, not because of who we are. He loves us in spite of, of, of the fact that we turn our backs and we sin against him. We can never be good enough on our own, but guess what? Jesus is. Jesus is good enough. Jesus, as we read earlier, came to fulfill the law, to accomplish that which you and I cannot do for ourselves. And because of him, we stand as righteous before God. Imagine this, picture this. You're in your bathroom and you look in the mirror every morning. And when you look in the mirror, I challenge you to see the face of Christ in your face. Why? Because Christ lives in you. Jesus lives in you. You were bought at a price. You're no longer yours, you're his. Through faith in Jesus Christ, we know we're bought at a price, and that price was his blood that was poured out on the cross. In his perfect life, he lived, and carrying our sins to the cross, the punishment we deserve is paid for. And so Jesus now lives in us. And not only that then, as you look in that mirror, I want you to realize that you wear the face of Jesus as you go into the world, and now you do good works as a reflection of Christ, to others we go out into the world and carry Jesus through love and compassion helping others to know Jesus is the Lord and Savior of their lives as well Jesus by the power of his Holy Spirit is working through us and out to others it doesn't earn us anything but it's a blessing to be Jesus in this world here's the distinction the Pharisees did good works but they were dependent on themselves we do good works that are founded in Jesus as Jesus works through us and to others. So what does this look like? Well, I think the prophet Isaiah said it pretty well. Is not this the fast that I chose? To loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free and to break every yoke. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry, to bring the homeless poor into your house? When you see the naked, to cover him, and not to hide yourself from your own flesh. Then shall your light break forth like the dawn, and your healing shall spring up speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear God, guard. The light, the salt is going forth we are the salt. That's what Jesus said. And he goes into this whole thing about salt losing its saltiness, but does that ever really happen? No. The salt is a good thing. You take bland food and you put a little salt on it, it makes it better, right? Bacon's not the only thing that makes things better. Salt does it too. I don't care what your cardiologist says, right? Salt is good. But if you oversalt something, what does it do? It ruins it. I love how the Apostle Paul fits language to this lesson that basically says when we carry Jesus to the world, even when we're proclaiming the law, we do it with gentleness and respect. We do it with love. And then Jesus goes on to say about light. He says, you're the light of the world. And in a very similar way, light is a good thing when you have just the right amount we try to make it comfortable lighting in here for you as you worship. I know that uh, the, just the right amount of light is a good thing. But too much light and you're what? You're blinded, right? You're blinded. We just had like 14 days of clouds. The sun came out of it like, whoa, whoa, you know? You're driving at night and somebody accidentally leaves their headlights on. You know what I'm talking about. It hurts. But we're not about hurting people. We're about helping them know their sinfulness, and know their Savior. Just the right amount. Here's what Jesus says. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven so that they might see Jesus in you. How do we do it? Living out our calling, loving people, and serving the world. Amen.
And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.